Hello everyone, in this lecture podcast, I will spend time talking about the topic on taxation, appropriation, and spending. When you think about it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that ta taxation, spending, and appropriation should be a source of major conflict between the Commonwealth and the states, uh, mainly because every government needs uh, to raise revenues for its activities and for its operations. And it is not just the Commonwealth that has to ensure that it has enough funds to uh, do what it needs to do under the Constitution, but states as well have a responsibility directly to the people who live uh, within, their, within, within the states. And so therefore, for instance, if we talk about the power to tax, uh, it is simply impossible for a government to be able to operate or even exist without the ability to raise revenues for its operations, activities, and projects. And because we have two kinds of governments, we have the federal government on the one hand and the state government on the other, both governments, therefore, must find ways by which they can have uh, revenues or monies with which to fund their operations, activities, projects, and so on. Uh, it's also important to remember that uh, under Section 90 of the Constitution, uh, states are prohibited from imposing customs, duties, and excise, which power belongs exclusively to the Commonwealth Parliament. So that is already a clear limitation of the power of the states in relation to the power to tax. They are barred by the Constitution from imposing customs, duties, and excise taxes. And we will examine later on what we mean by excise taxes according to case law. And so states, therefore, have had to find ways by which they could raise revenues without going against the provision of Section 90 or without having to uh, impose duty, customs, duties, and excise. And they've, they've done this mainly through uh, what are known as license fees. But a lot of these license fees, as we, as we will later on see, have actually been considered by the court, by the high court, to be excise and therefore invalid. Now, uh, under Section 51, uh, subsection 2 of the Australian Constitution, the Commonwealth Parliament has the power to, uh, to ta has to, has the power to legislate in relation to taxation. Now, that is not a power that is exclusive to, obviously, to the Commonwealth Parliament. States, too, uh, under the Constitution, have a residual power to uh, impose taxes, uh, particularly, for example, income taxes, which uh, are quite common in, in every country. And yet today, we know that states do not impose income taxes on the people who live within the states. Unlike, for example, in uh, countries such as the United States or even in Canada, because of uh, their, their federal form of government, people who live there typically pay federal taxes in addition to state taxes. But in, in Australia, however, notwithstanding the fact that we both have a federal government and state governments, we only have one single income tax, and that is the tax that is imposed by the uh, Commonwealth government. And we wonder why, how this happened, knowing that uh, under the Constitution, there is nothing that says that states cannot impose taxes. So we'll examine this as well. And the uh, question about taxation is also important because uh, under the Constitution, for example, um, when there's a law that is passed relating to taxation, uh, that law must only deal with the imposition of taxation. It cannot relate to anything else. Or, and so we will look at that as well as the fact that under Section 53 of the Constitution, uh, the Senate uh, has no power to originate tax laws. And so uh, this lecture podcast will also look into, uh, will obviously look, look into in detail uh, as to what is a tax and what is an excise? So after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain what constitutes a tax, discuss and explain what is an excise, 
and discuss and explain the power of states to validly pass taxes and license fees. So let's begin by uh, looking again at uh, Section 51, Subsection 2, which states that the Parliament shall have power to make laws with respect to taxation. So again, we need to remember that uh, taxes are actually considered the lifeblood of any government. So even in the absence of uh, any written constitution, or even if there may be a written constitution and it is silent as to whether or not a, 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 a government has the power to tax across all jurisdictions, it is a, a common understanding that every government has the inherent power of taxation, simply because without the ability to tax, no government can function. Uh, however, in the case of Australia, uh, it is in, uh, stated clearly in uh, Section 51, Subsection 2, that the Commonwealth Parliament has the power to make laws with respect to taxation. But just bear in mind that the power to tax is in fact an inherent power of any government. You cannot have a government that is not able to uh, impose taxes. Now, perhaps the only country or countries that are in a position not to impose taxes uh, would be Saudi Arabia and perhaps many of the other Gulf countries there, maybe Abu Dhabi uh, and uh, you know, the other, or the UAE, perhaps uh, they also are not imposing taxes, but that is because these uh, countries are really wealthy in terms of petrol dollars, the ability, their ability to be producing, uh, to, the, I mean, the, the, the fact that they have uh, millions of tons of oil uh, in their deserts and uh, their ability, therefore, to process these oils and sell them to the international market means that they don't have to tax uh, their people. So Saudi, Saudi Arabia is just one of a few countries that does not impose uh, income taxes because it is already wealthy. But for other countries which are not as uh, wealthy based on their natural resources, it is imperative for those countries, meaning for, for the rest of the nations of the world, to impose taxes. Um, if, if you look at taxes, for example, Australia, the, the, income, the, the maximum tax rate for Australia is about 35%. Canada has uh, a maximum tax rate of 50%. The United States has about 56%. Sweden has a tax rate of about 60%. And uh, Denmark has a tax rate of uh, 48%. Uh, the other thing we need to uh, remember is that the power of taxation is actually extensive. Um, in two senses. One is that the fact alone that a tax may be deemed uh, harsh or even confiscatory, meaning what if uh, for one reason or another, the Commonwealth Parliament, for example, decides to uh, impose taxes of as much as 80% on the income of highly paid individuals, meaning those who might be earning, let's say, $3 million uh, a year or more. And so therefore, you know, what if the Commonwealth Parliament passes a law that uh, for those kinds of individuals with such kind of income, uh, it would only be uh, correct and uh, beneficial that they be taxed, let's say, at the, at the uh, rate of 80%. Would that mean that um, because it's almost confiscatory, would it mean that the law that com the Commonwealth Parliament would pass would be unconstitutional and invalid? And the answer is no. Uh, as uh, the High Court has stated in Deputy Federal Commissioner of Taxation uh, versus True Hold Benefit Pro 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 Proprietary Limited, even if a tax is harsh, it would still be a valid tax. And uh, even, if, even if a tax may not benefit the person who has been taxed, at least directly, that still will not invalidate a law. And um, you, you, what if, for example, there is a law where the Commonwealth Parliament passes, which uh, provides that even those who have very low incomes of, let's say, $1,000 a year, somehow, uh, you know, just in a theoretical scenario, would still be subject to taxation. Would it mean that because uh, 
uh, and let's say that taxes would be about 35%, would it mean that uh, because it can potentially cause untold hardship upon those uh, who are uh, not financially able uh, to, to, to even pay for basic necessities, would that mean that the law be, would, would then be in, invalid? The answer is still no, because the power of taxation is uh, quite extensive and um, it is not for the courts to look into the wisdom, for example, uh, of you know, to whom the uh, taxes will fall or the rates of taxation. The other key point we need to remember is that uh, because of the expansionary consequences of uh, the engineer's case, uh, it, 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 it is possible uh, for the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on matters which themselves would not have been directly within uh, the ambit of its power. So, for example, um, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament does not have a power to uh, legislate, for example, in relation to the environment and in relation to education. And yet, if uh, the Commonwealth Parliament were to pass a law uh, of imposing a tax, and in doing so, that, uh, that, that uh, tax was meant to be uh, for the purpose of uh, education or in relation to the environment, which are not areas that or heads of power, which uh, the Commonwealth Parliament can claim to, still they would be uh, valid. Uh, pe uh, that they would be valid pieces of legislation because uh, of the expansionary consequences of the engineer's case. In other words. Um, as uh, the court said in the engineer's case, they are uh, loath to uh, consider some implicit limitations on the uh, power of the Commonwealth to legislate. The, the engineer's case took a more literal approach so that unless there is an express prohibition or an express limitation on the power of the Commonwealth to legislate on a specific subject for as long as the Australian Constitution has granted the Commonwealth Parliament the power to legislate on a specific head of power, uh, the High Court will not uh, read an implicit or an implied limitation on the legislative powers of the Commonwealth Parliament. Now, when I said earlier as an example that uh, by using its taxing power, it would be possible for the Commonwealth Parliament to actually uh, legislate on fields or subjects which ordinarily would not belong to the Commonwealth Parliament. That occurs only when there is a connection between the, tax, the power of taxation, uh, meaning between the tax and uh, the other subjects. So, for example, the, that's in the scenario I gave, uh, it involved a tax whose purpose was to fund uh, education, for example, or a, a tax for the purpose of um, of uh, funding research projects and so on, or it could be a tax for the purpose of uh, enhancing the environment. So you can see the link between the two. But if the, a law uh, concerns taxation, and in the process of and in that same law, there is an altogether uh, different subject such as um, environment but there is no direct connection between the two it just happens that in that taxation taxing law there is there are certain provisions that relate to the environment that law would be invalid because um, under the constitution if it is a law that um, is on taxation then such a law must only uh, talk about taxation and no other. And that is to avoid uh, the, no, the idea of uh, tacking, which we will discuss briefly in a short while. Now, the, uh, the Constitution, uh, under Section 51, Subsection 2, pros proscribes the Commonwealth Parliament from passing laws on taxation that would discriminate between states or between parts of states. So this would mean that if the Commonwealth Parliament passes a law and um, in some, some, 
and uh, that tax law would impose higher taxes on on the uh, on the on the uh, people or residents of a certain state, and other states would have uh, lower taxes. Then, in that case, the the tax law would run afoul of Section fifty one subsection two because then. Uh, that law would be discriminating between states. The idea being that if there is a law of taxation, it should not discriminate between states or between uh, parts of states. Now, the, the other thing, as I said, to remember is that uh, the power to tax is not exclusive to the Commonwealth Parliament. So therefore, um, states too can impose taxes, except that uh, they cannot impose uh, customs duties and excise nor can they impose income taxes. Uh, the, pro the, the reason why states cannot uh, impose taxes, I mean, cannot impose customs, duties, and excise, is uh, based on the prohibition of Section 90 of the Constitution. But in relation to uh, their inability today to uh, pass income taxes, this is because the, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament has uh, previously passed a... Uh, a set of uh, legislation relating to taxation that essentially meant that they occupied the field concerning taxation. So we will remember that um, while it is permit, while the grant of uh, power upon the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate in relation to those subjects in under Section Fifty One is not exclusive to the Commonwealth Parliament, unless. But it can implicitly it can implicitly be considered that um, that that specific subject can only be one that the uh, Commonwealth Parliament can legislate on because it affects uh, the Commonwealth. For example, um, issues about uh, about uh, borrowing money on the public credit of the Commonwealth. Obviously, that is something that uh, can only uh, be uh, exercised by the Commonwealth Parliament. But otherwise, uh, as far as others are, other subjects are concerned, it is understood that uh, the subjects under Section 51 are subjects over which states themselves can also legislate. Which leads us to the question of uh, how then did it happen that um, states no longer Impose income taxes, and so uh, there are two reasons for this. And one of is one of one of them is that it is a uh, constitutional principle as well that even if both the states and the Commonwealth Parliament can legislate on the same subject, such as those in Section Fifty One, the moment the uh, Commonwealth Parliament has evinced a clear intention to occupy the field fully and completely it would then mean that states can no longer uh, legislate on that same subject or field. So that, that's, that's the basic rule. And when, therefore, the Commonwealth Parliament passed a set of legislation, in 90, tax legislation in 1942, it effectively meant that uh, the Commonwealth Parliament was stating an express intention that they did not want states to uh, occupy uh, the same field or to legislate on the same field so that in effect, as of 1942, uh, income taxes have uh, were monopolized by uh, the Commonwealth. And um, the, the other effect, so th this was born about by uh, four pieces of legislation. One was the Income Tax Act of 1942. The other one was the State Grants Income Tax Reimbursement Act of 1942. The other one was the Income Tax Wartime Arrangements Act of 1942. And the other is the um, the uh, Income Tax Assessment Act of 1942. Now, wh what needs to be uh, pointed out is that because of the uh, the power of the Commonwealth to tax, and uh, because of its uh, intention. And the expression of that intention through uh, legislation to occupy the field concerning income taxes, what the Commonwealth did with a, with, a, with a set of legislation was that in return for states not being able to uh, impose any income taxes on its residents or on its subjects, 
through the State Grants Income Tax Reimbursement Act of 1942, where the treasurer of uh, the Commonwealth was satisfied that um, the, the state, a particular state government, for example, was not imposing income taxes, then the, the state, uh, the, the Commonwealth government would then uh, provide an income tax reimbursement to those states. But because the, the, uh, that specific law, for example, the state grants income tax reimbursement because of that specific law, what it, uh, what it enabled in the end was that in the process of uh, granting, uh, providing financial grants to, to the states, the Commonwealth Parliament was then in a position to a great extent to direct the states uh, to, do, to do certain things on subjects over which the Commonwealth Parliament would have had no power to legislate on in the first place. So, for example, when the Commonwealth Parliament may uh, grant uh, certain uh, uh, income tax reimbursements to a specific state, it would be possible and valid and legal for the Commonwealth Parliament to say that uh, this part of the uh, income tax re reimbursement is for the purpose of funding education or for the purpose of building roads or for the purpose of building hospitals and so on. So that was what happened initially um, in uh, 1942. And there was also an attempt on the part of the Commonwealth Parliament to, to um, pass, like, to, to kind of connect the, uh, the income tax reimbursements with uh, requirements that the, so, some parts of those uh, gr financial grants to the states would be in relation, for example, to unemployment benefits or pharmaceutical benefits, uh, medical and dental benefits, or even uh, allowances for students and families and so on, which again uh, were fields or subjects that do not belong to the uh, Commonwealth Parliament. However, eventually this has been validated constitutionally when the, uh, the Commonwealth was successful in a referendum in inserting uh, Section 51, subsection 23A in the Australian Constitution during the 1946 referendum, so that now it, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament also has the power with respect to the provision of maternity allowances, widow's pensions, child endowment, unemployment, pharmaceutical sickness and hospital benefits, medical and dental services. And as well as benefits to students and family allowances. Now, these, now in relation to the, the four laws or pieces of legislation uh, that I mentioned and which you see on the slide, um, these laws were upheld by the High Court in South Australia versus Commonwealth uh, in the first uniform tax case and in Victoria versus Commonwealth or the uh, second uniform tax case. So when uh, South Australia questioned the constitutionality of these four pieces of legislation before the High Court, the High Court upheld the validity of each piece of legislation. For example, in the case of uh, the Income Tax Act of 1942, uh, Chief Justice Latham said that uh, because the legislation is an ordinary tax law and it is a law with uh, respect to taxation, uh, it was not for the court to determine the limits of the rate of taxes which uh, Parliament uh, decided to impose on the people. So it recognized the uh, extensiveness of the power of uh, the Commonwealth to tax. In relation to the uh, Income Tax Assessment Act, which gave priority uh, for uh, individuals to pay uh, the income tax first to the Commonwealth before they paid any other taxes in the states, um, the High Court also upheld the validity of this specific law. So even if the states complained or South Australia was complaining that the, the, the effect of uh, these four pieces of legislation was to incapacitate or to uh, make uh, 
the operations of states uh, more difficult. Again, uh, based on the uh, engineer's uh, case, the High Court was unwilling to read any implicit assumption in the Australian Constitution that actually delimited the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on any subject that is within Section 51 of the Australian Constitution. So um, going by the uh, engineer's case and using a very literal approach in the interpretation of the Constitution, the High Court said that uh, in the absence of any express prohibition or express limitation on the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to legislate on a subject, if it had a power under Section 51 to legislate on a specific subject, then the High Court would not uh, read any uh, limitation on it based on something that is implied or implicit. Uh, in relation to the uh, Income Tax Wartime Arrangements Act, which had the effect of uh, requiring the states to surrender uh, to the Commonwealth government those properties, uh, even offices, personnel, records, and documents that pertain to the process of taxation. So in a sense, it, it was like the, it was as if the Commonwealth Parliament confiscated certain properties that uh, should have initially belonged to the Commonwealth Parliament. This specific piece of legislation was recognized as valid and affirmed as valid by the High Court uh, as, as an exercise of the uh, Commonwealth Parliament to legislate with respect to the defense of the Commonwealth. And this is so because if you will remember, uh, many of you obviously were born then, including me. Uh, 92 was, 1942 was a time when Australia, like most of the rest of the world, was at war. So, it, so during that time, um, the High Court, as we will later on see uh, in the succeeding uh, lecture podcasts, the, the Commonwealth Parliament was able to pass legislation that during peacetime or during those times when Australia would not have would not have been at war, would have been invalidated by the High Court. But because of the, uh, because of the period of war, then uh, the High Court was uh, more willing to provide a one wider ambit for the Commonwealth Parliament to exercise its legislative power in defense of the, uh, the Commonwealth. Um, and in relation, for example, and in relation to the uh, the State Grants Income Tax Reimbursement Act of 1942, the High Court pointed out that um, that piece of uh, legislation was valid, uh, more so because uh, under the Constitution, under Section 96, for example, uh, the Commonwealth Parliament has the power to provide financial assistance to any state on such terms and conditions as the parliament thinks fit. And so um, just before we leave this specific subtopic, the, so the reason why the uh, states no longer impose taxes of their own or impose state taxes, unlike in the United States or in Canada, for example, where both the federal government and the state governments impose taxes, so a Canadian or an American is, has to pay federal taxes and state taxes at the same time. The reason why in Australia there is only one single uh, uniform tax, and that is a tax that is imposed and collected by the uh, Commonwealth government, that is because, um, because of the set of legislation, what happened was that the states essentially uh, gave up their power to, to tax on the condition that the uh, Commonwealth Parliament was going to reimburse them the value of the taxes that they would ha that they lost uh, when they when it was the, then the uh, Commonwealth Parliament that ended up uh, collecting these taxes. Now moving on, why would it be important for us to know what is a tax? Um, well, the first reason would be that. Um, under Section 55 of the, the Constitution, any law that deals with taxation must only deal with the imposition of taxation. So if a law 
for example, would deal with migration and taxation, as happened in the case of Air Caledoni International versus the Commonwealth, uh, that law would be invalid. And the reason for that is that it essentially, the, the provision of, that co- of the Constitution essentially is trying to avoid the idea of tacking. And tacking means that typically when a tax legislation is passed, there's always a lot of negotiation and uh, backroom dealings among the, the, well, we may call them politicians or, you know, the, the legislators. So there's, there's a lot of uh, negotiations and um, compromises going on. And um, it may be that in order for a, taxing, a tax law to be passed, it would typically mean that they would tap onto that tax law uh, a provision which actually has nothing to do with uh, taxation. And this is something that happens often uh, in the United States where uh, a tax law would have tacked into it a provision that has nothing to do with taxation. So uh, a piece of legislation may be on taxation and then talk about uh, the building of a monument in the state of Washington or talk about um, the development of... uh, a special recreation facility in a certain area or talk about a certain, uh, even if it's about taxation, it may then have tacked into that uh, tax law something that talks about providing certain special financial grants to certain individuals of a certain state. So that is not permitted in uh, our constitution because Section 55 is quite clear that laws dealing with taxation shall deal only with the imposition of taxation. Uh, As important, under Section 53, uh, there are limits to the power of the Senate relating to laws that impose taxes because proposed laws imposing taxation shall not originate in the Senate. It can only be originated from uh, the lower house. Second, the Senate may not amend uh, proposed laws imposing taxes and the Senate may not amend any proposed law so as to increase any proposed change or burden on the people. So in other words, taxation is crucial not only because it affects the ability of a, of a, of a government to raise revenues, it is also important because of the limitations imposed by the Constitution in matters relating to taxation the other point that needs to be uh, to be to be clarified or made clear is that there are as I pointed out earlier there are certain taxes that the states cannot impose particularly customs duties and excise uh, based on section 90 section 90 and income taxes as well and as I said um, the reason why states uh, no longer impose state taxes state income taxes is is because of the State Grants Income Tax Reimbursement Act of 1942, where under Section 4, uh, it provides that um, the treasurer is satisfied that the state has not imposed a tax upon incomes, then they shall be payable by way of financial assistance to that state uh, certain uh, income tax reimbursements. In other words, if states impose taxes, then they would not receive the uh, any financial assistance uh, from the Commonwealth government. So let's begin by talking about what is a tax. So uh, the classic definition of what is a tax is found in uh, the case of uh, Matthews versus Chicory Marketing Board, Victoria, where the High Court said that ta- a tax is a compulsory exaction of money by a public authority for public purposes enforceable by law. So there are three key features there. It must be a compulsory exaction. Two, the exaction must be for a uh, public purpose. And three, the the exaction must be enforceable by law. And this is based on um, the case of a Caledoni International versus the Commonwealth, which we will examine in greater detail in a short while. Now, you will notice that I highlighted uh, the phrase public authority. Uh, I I highlighted that because, as we will later on see, it is not actually 
and a, a key characteristic of, a, of a tax that it has to be uh, collected or, uh, by a public authority. It is possible for uh, a private entity to actually be collecting uh, some monies, and yet the fact that it is a compulsory exaction of money for a public purpose that is enforceable by law would mean that it would still be a tax even if it is actually collected by a, 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 a private authority. Although um, the High Court has also pointed out the fact that the fact that uh, it is that a private entity is collecting uh, the, the tax would mean that for that purpose, it is in fact a public authority, even if it is in truth or in actual fact a private entity. But we're going to go to that uh, more deeply in a short while. So in Air Caledonia International versus the Commonwealth, a law was passed amending the Migration Act, whereby a fee for immigration clearance was to be collected by an airline operator, such as the Air Caledonia International. And uh, this was to be collected in respect of all international airline passengers entering Australia. It made no distinction between Australian citizens and foreigners. The High Court held that the exaction, the exaction to the extent that it exceeds the value of services rendered is properly to be seen as a tax. So the, the, the key point here that we need to notice is that if the, the exaction is, for, uh, is to recompense for the actual value of services rendered, then that exaction would not be a tax. But if the exaction exceeds the value of the services rendered to the extent of that excess, that would be considered a tax. And uh, that is based on um, the, the, the court's decision in Air Caledonia International versus the, uh, versus the Commonwealth. What also needs to be remembered in this case is that the main reason why the High Court felt that uh, this was a tax, was that it imposed a, that fee for immigration clearance upon all, whether they were Australian citizens or not. But because there was no reason why Australian citizens had to get an immigration clearance, then obviously th there was no value for them from any service that was to be done by the alien operator. So in relation to the Australian citizens, there was no value of services for which a fee for immigration clearance should properly be imposed and collected. And so therefore, in that case, this was a tax. And because it was a tax, because the fee for immigration clearance was a tax, and that fee for immigration clearance uh, was based on an amendment of the, of the Migration Act of 1987, it therefore meant that there, there was a law uh, there was a single law that both pertained to migration as well as on taxation. In that case, uh, that, that is prohibited by Section 55, which, as I pointed out earlier, clearly provides that in relation to any tax law, that tax law must only deal with the matter of taxation and of no other. Now, the, the court in Air Caledonia International versus the Commonwealth also pointed out that uh, for a compulsory exaction to be a tax, it must have to mean that the payer has no choice about whether or not he acquires the services. So in this case, Australian citizens had no choice but to pay the uh, immigration clearance fee, even if they actually did not need uh, such service because they did not need any immigration clearance. And secondly, the amount of the exaction uh, clearly bo bore no discernible relationship with the value uh, that was acquired. So uh, that would show, therefore, that the tax was a compulsory exaction. The, the notion of public authority uh, has also been clarified by the court in uh, Australian Tape Manufacturers Association Limited versus uh, the Commonwealth, where a provision of the Cop Copyright Act of 1968 authorized a private society to collect 
royalties from vendors of blank tapes for the benefit of its members. So it was argued by the Commonwealth that because it was a private society that um, was collecting uh, the exaction or the amounts or royalties from vendors of blank tapes, and because uh, it is a private society, therefore, uh, that exaction could not be a tax. But uh, the High Court ruled in that case that it is not essential to the concept of, that, of a tax that the exaction should be by a public authority. In fact, uh, in that case, the High Court uh, clarified that at least for the purpose of uh, collecting the royalty, the Australian Tape Manufacturers, the Australian Tape Manufacturers Association would actually be deemed to be a, um, a public authority in the first place. So because uh, the Copyright Act obviously talks about the copyright and it is within the powers of the Commonwealth to legislate in the first place on copyright, and in that same act, it contained a tax that was imposed on uh, vendors of blank tapes for the benefits of the members of the society, then that uh, went afoul of Section 55 of the Australian Constitution. In Air Caledonia International versus the Commonwealth, the airline operator was also treated as a public authority, or at least that exaction by an air, a private airline operator, which obviously was not a public authority, uh, would, was, was not seen as something that would prevent the exaction as being interpreted or construed as a tax. So notwithstanding the fact that the amount was, or the fee for immigration clearance was being collected by a private entity and not a public authority, that fact alone would not mean that the exaction is not a tax. It still is a tax, even if it was collected by a private entity for as long as uh, that specific exaction was compulsory. It was, uh, it was also for a uh, public purpose. Now, in Australian Tape Manufacturers Association Limited versus uh, the Commonwealth, it was argued by the Commonwealth that it was not a tax because, remember, the royalty was meant to benefit the members of the Australian Tape Manufacturers Association or the members of the society. And so, therefore, uh, the exaction was not for a public purpose. But the High Court ruled that it was for a public purpose because it was meant to uh, fulfill a public purpose. Uh, it was meant to provide compensation of relevant copyright owners. So in other words, if you speak of public purposes, it is not, necessar it is not the same as speaking of governmental purposes. So public purposes uh, as a concept has a uh, wider field of ambit. Now we will talk about now about uh, what is not a tax. In Harper versus Victoria, there was a section of the Marketing of Primary Products Act 1958 of uh, Victoria that provided that every person presenting eggs under the section shall pay to the board for the grading, testing, marking, and stamping of such eggs, such fee or fees as may be fixed by the board to defray the expenses incurred therefore. Uh, the High Court ruled that the fee is not a tax for the reason that it is a charge for services rendered. So the services rendered being the one involving grading, testing, marking, and stamping of such, of such uh, eggs. Secondly, the purpose for which the fee is exacted obviously is to defray the cost of those services. However, if the, the fees that were imposed bore no relation to the expenditure incurred by it, with respect to the grading, testing, marking, and stamping of eggs delivered and presented to it. Or in other words, if the fee were over and above the usual costs associated with the services that the uh, board was meant to undertake, then to such an extent, those excess fees would be deemed a tax. But in this case, there was a clear correlation uh, 
between the amount of uh, fees that were being charged uh, uh, versus or in relation to the services that were actually rendered by the board. So therefore, that, uh, that law was deemed to be valid according to the, uh, according to the High Court. In Air Caledonia International versus the Commonwealth, the High Court stated that if the amount of the exaction has no discernible relationship with the value of what is acquired, the, circum the circumstances may be such that the exaction is, at least to the extent that it exceeds that value, properly to be seen as a tax. So in Air Caledonia International versus uh, the Commonwealth, the High Court ruled that um, uh, gave examples of what would not constitute a tax. Some of those examples would be a charge for the acquisition or use of property, a fee for a privilege, as well as a fine or penalty imposed for criminal conduct or breach of statutory duty. So any of these three would not be taxes. So these are examples given by uh, the High Court in Air Caledonia International as examples of those fees or charges that do not constitute as taxes. Uh, Section 53 of the Constitution also provides that a proposed law shall not be taken to impose taxation by reason only of its containing provision for the imposition of fines or other pecuniary penalties. Hence, Monetary penalties are imposed as penalties for violation of statutory offenses or penalties for default on payment of legal dues are not considered taxes. But a compulsory and enforceable exaction of money by a public authority for public purposes would still be a tax even if that uh, exaction would be described as a fee for services. So it will not be the denomination or the, the labeling or the description of a fee that would determine whether or not it is a tax, but its key characteristics, which means that it is, com it is compulsory, it is an enforceable exaction of money, and it is uh, for a public purpose. So even if it were labeled any other way, uh, that exaction, for as long as it meets the three minimum criteria, would still be considered a tax. Now, we will talk about, this time, about customs and uh, excise duty. So, under Section 90 of the Constitution, the Commonwealth Parliament has exclusive power to impose duties of customs and of excise. So, uh, under the clear provision of the Constitution, there is a clear prohibition against states imposing duties of customs and of excise. And uh, this specific uh, provision has also been a source of judicial attention because of the conflict between the Commonwealth and the states in this regard. And we will also begin to learn what an excise is uh, as we go through the cases that follow next. Now, um, as pointed out by the High Court in Harper versus Victoria and um, Air Services Australia versus Canadian Airlines, uh, we make a distinction, we should make a distinction between license and service fees, which are not taxes and which are not excise. So if the state exactions were in fact in the nature of license fees, or they are fees for services, or they are penalties, then they would, be, they would not be taxes, and because they could not be taxes, they also could not be an excise. So in other words, uh, for an exaction to be considered an excise, it must, in the first place, fit the description of a tax. And once it fits the description of a tax, the next question to be asked is, is it an excise tax? So in other words, every excise, every excise is a tax, but not every tax is an excise. So in other words, an excise is just an example of, of a tax. So other examples of taxes would be customs, duties, um, income taxes, um, stamp taxes. So there are many kinds of taxes, including excess taxes. So an excess ta an excise is always a tax, but not all taxes are excises. Um, in Capital Duplicators versus Australian Capital Territory number two, uh, a flat fee of 
was imposed plus an advance fee or a transaction fee calculated by reference to values of video supplied during a period of license as part of an overall scheme to control the distribution of X-rated videos to the public. So in other words, in that case, you see a reg an attempt at regulation. So that's crucial, as we will see later on, because as we will see, if it is part of a regulatory scheme, then it is possible to argue that it is not a, an excise, but it's really a license fee, because the nature of a license is actually to control or regulate a certain activity. But in this case, the High Court ruled that it was in fact an excise or an excise tax, because to, to be considered a license fee that would not amount to an excise, the exaction must be part of a regulatory, not a revenue generating scheme. And it must involve the imposition of a justifiable amount that is commensurate to the cost of implementing the scheme, as we previously saw. In this case, 40%, a flat fee of 40% uh, was quite clearly uh, seen as being revenue generating because it had no uh, direct connection to the uh, value of uh, the services rendered. And it couldn't be seen as really being part of a regulatory scheme that was designed to protect the public. So the substantial size of the fee, which is 40% plus an advanced fee or, tra or a transaction fee, uh, these uh, would indicate or would be factors that are crucial in trying to characterize uh, a license fee as being in fact and in law and excise, which states are not permitted to impose under the Constitution. In Dennis Hotels Proprietary Limited versus Victoria, the uh, Licensing Act of 1958 was passed by the Victorian Parliament, where license fees uh, were imposed for the sale of liquor, and it was and they were calculated based on the cost of liquor purchased by a licensee in the previous year. So in other words, the license fee was uh, for the sale of liquor was, was uh, just to clarify or just to emphasize, was calculated based on the cost of liquor purchased by a licensee in the previous year, not in the current year. So in other words, whatever the sales were this year, that was irrelevant because the license fee was based on uh, the previous year's uh, sales, not this, uh, pre this current year's sales. And we will see why this is important in a short while. The High Court ruled in that case that, the, that uh, those license fees were actually license fees and were not an excise because the exaction was only in respect of the business generally and not in respect of any particular act done in the course of the business. And this was so because there was no connection between the license fees and any particular sale. So there was no connection between the license fees and any particular sale because remember, the license fees were, were uh, based on the sales of the previous year. It was not based on the sale as of today or this current year. So there was no connection between the amount of license fee to be paid and what was being, being sold today or in the current year. Because of this lack of connection, it couldn't be considered a, an excise. In Harper versus uh, Minister for Sea Fisheries, the Tasmanian government imposed a license fee for the right to take abalone in uh, state fishing water. And because the license fee was calculated pro rata, to the amount of abalone taken. So if you think about Pareta, it means that the amount of license fee you pay depends on the volume or the amount of the abalone that you take. And we will see that typically that kind of, it's considered kind of considered ad valorem. It's based on the value. If it's based on the value, usually you would see that as an excise. And so there, therefore in this case, uh, an, argument, an argument was made that that license fee was actually an excise, and which was therefore beyond the power of Tasmania to impose. But the High Court ruled that it was a valid license fee, because even if it was calculated pro rata to the amount of abalone taken, 
it was in fact a fee, a fee paid for the privilege of taking a limited natural resource that is liable to damage, exhaustion, or destruction by uncontrolled exploitation by the public. And uh, we will remember that the High Court had already previously said uh, in Air Caledonia International versus the Commonwealth that a charge for the acquisition or use of property, such as the one in, um, in, that, Tasmanian, in, in that Tasmanian case, is not considered a tax. Okay, so moving on. So what exactly is a, an excise? In Parton versus Milk Board, Victoria, the Victoria Milk Board, uh, the Victorian Parliament created a milk board which was funded by a levy on every dairy man other than the owner of a milk shop who sells or distributes milk in the metropolis and every owner of a milk depot who sells or distributes milk to any person in the metropolis. The levy was a sum equal to one quarter of a penny per gallon for every gallon of milk so sold or distributed. The High Court ruled that the law imposed an excise. It was clearly a tax. It was a compulsory uh, exaction. It was an exaction by a governmental agency. And the objects are governmental, obviously. And clearly, it was not a charge for services because the board performed no particular service for the dairyman or the owner of a milk depot. And it was clearly a tax upon goods, and that is essentially uh, what an excise tax is about. It is a tax on goods. So it was, in fact, a tax upon the milk that was sold or distributed for consumption in Melbourne. The excise tax, an excise tax is essentially also a trading tax. And so customs and excise duties are, in their essence, trading taxes and may be said to be more concerned with the commodity and in respect of which the taxation is imposed than with the particular person for whom the tax is exacted. Uh, it falls within the definition uh, of excise if it is a duty that is charged on home goods, either in the process of their manufacture or before their sale to the home consumers. In the same case, in Parton versus uh, Milk Board of Victoria, the High Court also ruled that the tax to be an excise must bear a close resemblance to the production or manufacture, the sale or the consumption of goods, and must be of such a nature as to affect them as the subjects of manufacture or production or as articles of commerce. And finally, in Ha versus New South Wales, a New South Wales Act levied a license fee that was equal to 75 or 100 percent of the value of tobacco sold during a relevant period. The High Court ruled that the fees were manifestly duties of excise on the tobacco during the relevant periods. So it was an inland tax on a step in production, manufacture, sale, or distribution of goods. So therefore, it was a duty of excise. It was clearly a tax on a step in the production or distribution of goods to the point of receipt by the consumer. So therefore, it is a duty of tax. And the calculation of license fees uh, was based on the value of goods sold during the previous year, shows that it is a revenue generating inland tax on goods. Uh, it is also an indicator of being an excise, the fact that uh, there was a clear proximity of the relevant period to the license period and size of the tax imposed ad valorem. Now, how do we distinguish this case? Because in this case, the, uh, the license fees uh, were also uh, based on the value of tobacco sold during the previous year. And if you will remember in the case of uh, Dennis Hotels, the license fees was based on the cost of liquor purchased by a manufacturer, by a licensee in the previous year. What is the distinction? Um, in this particular case, if you look at Dennis proprietary, Hotels Proprietary Limited, the, the license fees here 
uh, are based on uh, the cost of liquor purchased by a licensee, not by the uh, the buyers of the liquor themselves, not by consumers. So in this case, it it wasn't really in relation to the actual sale, but actually based on the cost of liquor purchased by a licensee. So in this particular case, therefore, there was no connection between the license fees and any particular sale. However, if you look at the case of Ha versus uh, New South Wales, we will see that the license fee is actually based on the value of tobacco sold during a relevant period. So in other words, value of tobacco sold to consumers. So therefore, you determine the value of the license fee based on the amount, gener the amount of sales generated uh, in terms of the sale of the tobacco to the consumer. So even if it was in the previous year, it was still based on the sale to consumers. Whereas in the one, in the case of the Dennis Hotels, it was really based on the purchase by the licensee or the hotel owner of, uh, of liquor. So that made the distinction. So uh, having discussed these cases and discussed the concepts, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain what constitutes a tax, discuss and explain what is an excise, and discuss and explain the power of states to validly pass taxes and license fees.